and this is uh, this is part of my of my education campaign to the universe. I want to convince the scientists of the universe <coughs> that um, a uh, an operating principle that unites what the theorists are able to tell us about many many body quantum dynamics and what the experimentalists are able to realize in the lab. An organizing principle is transient impulsive excitation. And if you want to know what transient impulsive excitation is, you know that bell that rings at the end of coffee break is an example of transient impulsive excitation. I can guarantee, I can guarantee that that hammer is not a tuned instrument. But this is a Swiss <laughs> but the bell, the bell has resonant frequencies which can be excited because that hammer is so broadband. And that's the impulse. So now you get the idea. Now you can, you can just drink your coffee and doze for the rest of the lecture. This was working before. It was working before and then I undid it. Now, <clears throat> laser interactions with electrons produce a hierarchy of motion in molecules, lots of different time scales. Uh, that's good, because us experimentalists may we only have access to some of those time scales, and then we can pretend that the time scales we have access to are precisely the time scales we needed by judicious choice of physical problem to study. Now you know how that works. Mm. So, molecules undergo free rotation in space, which can be picoseconds or more, actually for hydrogen, which you might think would rotate pretty fast. Uh, its slowest uh, quantum uh, constant of rotation is on the order of a picosecond, and the bigger things are even slower. So in this attosecond conference, rotation is imponderably slow, but we can still study that. The molecules also bend and stretch, and the time scale for that is tens to hundreds of femtoseconds. The time scale for the binding electron motion in small time scales. That's determined by particle in a box. It's determined by the fact that the Coulomb binding potential is something that produces a bound state that's always on the order of an angstrom. <clears throat> you know, this is the reason why you know, all, all atoms are to first approximation the same size, uh, because uh, that last electron always sees only a simply charged object that it has to be bound to. And so it's always, box is always the same size, about an angstrom. And so you, you, you stick these things together, and the binding motion is determined by that angstrom uh, size and the Rupert binding energy to be on the order of a femtosecond, a couple femtoseconds or shorter. And then finally, we get to the attoseconds part of this. The, those inner electrons can be bound by hundreds of volts or kilovolts, and they, and they are confined they are the ones that are confined to by, by inner charges of the nuclei that are much higher than a single charge. And so that's much smaller than an angstrom, and so that implies out of second motion. So we get this whole time scale uh, hierarchy here. And it's all, of course, subject to the ultimate barrier that we have to deal with in real world physics, which is that the speed of light is three angstroms per attosecond. So will we do zeptosecond atomic physics? I think no. <clears throat> we might do zeptosecond nuclear physics, because nuclei are small enough, but not, not atomic physics. This attosecond time scale is a, is a playground we can play in for a long time. OK, so <clears throat> we want to launch and probe this motion. Launch and probe, pump and probe, that's, that's our, our method. And uh, our, uh, our guidebook, the rule book, is a single line here in non relativistic quantum mechanics, Schrodinger's equation, of course, first order differential equation in time. So all the dynamics is there. And, and our part as experimentalists <coughs> is to add an extra piece to that Hamiltonian. Laser, particle beam, whatever it is. So now, we have an explicitly time-dependent part. 
whereas the ordinary Hamiltonian object that we're dealing with will typically, the Hamiltonian will not be time dependent. All the dynamics comes from this equation, not from the time dependence of the natural Hamiltonian. That will not be true once we turn on our laser and we have an explicit time dependence. So what are we going to do with that? Well, that interaction Hamiltonian uh, is, of course, the way we view the world. So we can think of it as our shutter speed, shutter speed for making molecular movies, single frame, uh, also as the starter pistol for initiating dynamics. And in the impulse limit, the shutter speed has to be fast compared to the natural motion. So I've just described the hierarchy of natural motion. And, and that means that the time uh, that we're talking about has to be less than something that's inversely proportional to the spectral energy splittings uh, simply by Heisenberg, you might say. And also, so that's short, that's the impulse limit. Uh, in addition to the impulse limit, we also uh, might have other technical uh, uh, things that we want to accomplish that, are, that, that will cause us to be interested not only in this time, but also in the relative size of Hn compared to H0, the relative size. The applied field has to be strong enough to alter the natural dynamics, or else there's nothing that we can see in the lab. So here's our sources. We've talked about them throughout the week. First of all, uh, there's uh, optical lasers, and I'll concentrate on titanium sapphire because it's the most commonly used for this kind of thing for completely boring technical reasons. You know, if, we'd been, have, if we had this uh, winter school in 1989 or 1990, it, this would have been a dye laser. But by 1992, it was a Tysaf laser, has been that way for the, for, for, for the, the succeeding uh, whatever it is, quarter century. Uh, so that's our, that's our visible laser. But of course, it's, it, it's something that through nonlinear optics and atomic physics, we've been able to convert into high harmonics. And look, that's a much higher uh, bandwidth and therefore uh, capable of much shorter pulses. That gets us into the out of second regime. And now we have X-ray free electron lasers, which are tunable over, over, over orders of magnitude centered on X-ray wavelengths, which means that we have all the bandwidth we could ever want. All we need to do is learn how to control it in order to use it. OK, so two-dimensional plot here. Time versus intensity. As we go up in intensity, we increase the size of this guy as we as we change the time scale, we go from uh, being able to look at femtosecond down to out of second processes. So let me start with something that is about 15 <coughs> uh, years or more old, and that is just to, to demystify something. I mean, people think, oh, it's so exotic. Well, you know, the wonderful thing about Coulomb systems is that they have any energy splitting you want. You just have to find the right pair of principal quantum numbers. You could be doing microwave ultrafast wave packet spectroscopy if you wanted, and there are people who, who have built their careers on that as well. Uh, and uh, just as an example, something that we did a while back, weak field now, not strong field, is uh, excite a superposition state of Rydberg wave packets just to get into this regime, delta t less than 1 over the energy splitting, and then you make a superposition and it can evolve, and you can do a, a pump probe kind of experiment to map the evolution of the wave packet in space, and it looks like this. The nucleus is here. This is the outer turning point of the outer Rydberg orbital that we study. These are all p orbitals, so they all look like these jelly donuts in three-dimensional space, and if I plot the radial coordinate, you see as a function of time, it oscillates back and forth just because of the natural evolution, free evolution of these time scales. So that's a way that to initiate and observe dynamics. This is very boring by today's standard, but it actually isn't too different from everything that we're doing. It's just that we've now moved these down into the regime where we can look at bonds breaking and being made in molecules and that sort of thing, and maybe, maybe, maybe learn more than here. We can, here we learn uh, about the dispersion of uh, Kepler orbits. Okay, it's not that, not that big a deal. Okay. That was weak field. Now let me talk about just sort of the way to think about turning up the field strength so that you can begin to interact a little bit more strongly with your system. 
and still in this impulsive regime. So by impulsive, I just mean that time scale restriction. Time scale short compared to the energy split. That didn't have anything to do with the field strain. The cowbell could be tapped just very lightly, and it would still work. Right. So let's turn it up a little bit. We'll go. We'll go now into this Cromer's Heisenberg regime. Not yet super strong field non perturbative science. Still perturbation theory works, but second order, so that you get intensity dependent effects. Okay, everybody should know basically about second order time dependent perturbation theory. And uh, the uh, interaction with material systems is encapsulated in something called the Cromer's Heisenberg formula. And I'm sure that you've seen it in some context before, but particularly. The version of Kramer's Heisenberg that I care about is not two photon absorption, but rather one photon in, one photon out, photon photon scattering. That's called Raman uh, excitation. And, and I want to look at this now in this impulse limit. OK, here's just a standard formula. I cut and pasted it out of, I don't know, whatever paper I did. But it has all of the features you expect for, from Kramer's Heisenberg, a two photon process. Here's the Feynman graph. Uh, initial state comes in, interacts with the photon, some intermediate state, which is just virtual because it's a single second order process here, uh, photon goes out, and now I have a final state. Here's the map. Single state, photon in, photon out. I mean this impulsive limit, so these photons have bandwidth, and now I can interact coherently with any of these states. Okay? Here's how it depends on, it depends on how many photons you have per mode in your field, it depends on the dipole couplings here and here. Here they are. It depends on other things having to do with the polarization and the frequencies of the field. To go to the impulse limit here, I have to convert this n number of photons per mode into uh, in, in a mode into intensity, uh, and then convert that intensity into the total fluence in my pulse. So the total transition probability then. It's just the integral over all of the energies in my pulse uh, of the fluence, and so it naturally goes like the intensity squared. And that's what you expect. It's a two-photon process. It better go like the intensity squared. OK, simple example of doing this. On the slowest time scale, I talked about just rotation. Nothing out a second yet. Okay. So I have a, a short pulse. And how can I think of this short pulse in classical electromagnetic field space, well, like you know, usually you write it out, E of T, okay? And then if I ask the question, what's the frequency content of that pulse, you'll say, well, it's left to the reader before you transform this in your head. But there are other ways of, of describing completely the classical electromagnetic field that are a little bit more useful than just E of T. And one of those ways is, of course, the Fourier transform of E of T. Well, that has its own problems. I could give you the spectrum, and for a Gaussian pulse, it would be a nice Gaussian spectrum, right? Also, the spectrum is also Gaussian. You say, okay, Gaussian spectrum, and phase is flat. Fourier transforms, I don't have to tell you the phase, right? Phase is flat, and you could say, what is the time dependence of this pulse? So, well, I leave that to the reader. You inverse Fourier transform this guy. Also a little bit less than completely obvious. But, as you know, as, as good theorists always know, this is very important for experimentalists too, but often they don't know it. Okay? What you should always do when you're about to solve a problem is find the appropriate basis for your spectrum. And I presented you E of t, E of omega, Neither one's pretty good. We have to kind of, let's, you know, time, frequency, let's go in between, okay? So one way to go in between is, to, uh, is by re-expressing the field through a Wigner distribution. It's now, instead of a complex function of frequency, it's now a real function of two variables, time and frequency. Uh, and it's completely derivable from either of those other two ways of completely describing the classical field. And uh, you can see it kind of looks like this correlation here. Here it looks like on a two-dimensional plot, uh, frequency and time. The line outs, if you integrate over all the frequencies, is the intensity versus time. And the line out, if you integrate over time, 
is intensity versus frequency. And if I have a, sh a, a short transform limited pulse, it just looks like a dot, a bullseye, a, a Gaussian hill on that, on that space. Now I'm going to use that bandwidth to do Raman excitation of some system rotationally. Okay, so that means I'm going to kick it. Now you know that's what I mean by kick. So kick now becomes one of these terms of art, like red or blue or doubling. Right, all these words that we use that people who aren't in our field will completely misunderstand what we're talking about. But we understand. We understand. Okay, so we'll kick the system, impulsively excited, and take a, a look at the expectation value of the alignment as a function of time, and it goes to periodic motions. We're making rotational wave packets. This, there, there are periods of angular focusing where the molecules all align. Actually, that happens very early. And then because these levels have a harmonic separation, the separation just increases linearly with the same linear constant every, every level, uh, that there, there, this is a polynomial expansion, which means that there will be revivals. That's what you need for revivals, for, for real revivals. Now, Coulomb systems don't have that because their space, spacing isn't describable by a polynomial series. It goes like one over energy squared, so we only get approximate revivals with Coulomb. Here you get real, truly, really revivals, assuming it's truly a rigid rotor. Okay. So there it looks, okay? And you can now begin to do impulsive physics with this system. Uh, and um, let me just uh, do the simplest thing, which is look at um, how I can uh, optimize the amount of alignment. This turns out to be just a practical thing. I happen to be in a business where I much prefer to work in the molecular frame all the time. So maybe I can create the molecular frame through impulsive excitation. That's a pretty cool way to do it. Uh, but then I have to get really, really good alignment. That means I want to optimize the expectation value of cosine squared theta in the lab. All the molecules aligned in the room. Okay. Uh, well, the first idea about how to do that is to uh, make sure that my gas is as cold as possible so that I have only a few of these rotational states initially excited. That will help. You can see it really does help. Here's a plot of what cosine squared theta should be as a function of different temperatures of gas for different kick strengths. This is a log scale of kick strength. So you can see you kick it harder. If it's colder, it works better. You can even get alignments up in the 0.9 range. You run into a problem when the dimensionless kick strength gets to about three dimensionless units. That is a really strong kick. That sort of corresponds to uh, Pierre, uh, instead of just uh, using the clapper on that bell, if he were to take a sledgehammer to the bell, <coughs> okay, it would stop working, <laughs> and it would stop working permanently, you know, you wouldn't be able to use it. So the same thing happens with molecule. If you kick it too hard, it dissociates, and then game over. So you can only kick it so hard. That means you have to make it very cold. OK. Let's do a little impulse physics here. What happens if we kick it a second time on one of these revivals? Here's the first revival, 8 picoseconds. That's a full revival. There is 8 picoseconds. Here's the delay scale. Kick it again, 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 kick it again. I can do that simply by creating a different electric field than this one. Here's an electric field that consists of eight Gaussian pulses with the right spacing, about eight picoseconds. Here's what the Wigner distribution looks like, the complete description now of this field, in case you care. Okay. And uh, if, you, if you keep each individual kick below this magic line, of course you can get you can overcome, the, you can see it gets more and more long. You can overcome this, uh, this, this death by kicking too hard and get much greater alignment, even for room temperature samples. You can get you know, alignment that is comparable to what you would have to get with very cold samples. So there's, there's just an example. Okay, I wouldn't say this is a momentous moment in human history, that, but it's a, it's a great instruction about the the utility of this impulse idea, impulse approximation, in getting different kinds of physics done in the lab. Okay. So of course, naturally, we did this. So let me just let me just wax 
uh, you know, go off on, 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 on telling you how wonderful it is just for a moment. Uh, again, expectation value of the alignment. And um, we began to try to do different kinds of physics with multiple kicks. Every kick has to be impulsive or none of this works. So this is really the impulse limit physics. Okay? One of the things you can do is change the, the uh, relative spacing of these kicks by introducing disorder. Now you might think that's not going to be very interesting because if I introduce disorder, I'm going to mess up this beautiful resonant kick stronger, kick, the kicks align more and more and more. And surprisingly, at least at first, surprisingly, that's not true. Uh, let's, let's take the case of no disorder. The kicks are absolutely uniformly spaced, but they're slightly off the resonance. They're not exactly on the exact revival. Well, what happens is what you might expect is a couple of wiggles, but pretty soon you get to a saturation because your kicks are now no longer doing, doing any, any positive benefit to the ensemble that was previously kicked. So you get some saturation, and you might expect that the position of the saturation point depends on how close you are to the resonance. Now, all you need to do is introduce disorder, and it will always get better. Periodic disorder, these are, these are simulations, periodic disorder, Get, get, gets you a little bit better. Aperiodic disorder gets you even a little bit better. Full disorder, just throw in a random number generator on the kicks, and actually that does the best. Uh, and if you compare this does the best with what you would do if you went back and now let's go exactly to the resonance and just keep increasing the number of kicks. You do better with full disorder. Here's perfect resonance. You get these nice little oscillations. And then it flattens out at a particular kick strength and at a picture amount of alignment and, and disorder is better. So that's interesting. That's actually, um, it's a, it's a, uh, uh, a, uh, uh, it's an analog mathematically to the same physics that's responsible for Anderson localization. It's actually a disorder induced localization phenomenon, in this case localization in angle space, introduced by disorder in a completely coherent system, non-dissipated coherent system. This is just what Anderson localization is about. I have a question. Yes? <coughs> For the last one, the kick on revival, if you made more kicks, would it go up again? No. It doesn't? Oh, oh would, it, would it start oscillating uh, with high, higher amplitude? Yes. Okay. I mean, it really looks so like it would start to go up again. Yeah, it, it, it does. That is, as this would, yeah, right. this, this, that, that's right. Above. Okay, the experiment, okay, we're experimentalists. We did we did this and we had these simulations. Our, our, our collaborators at Weizmann, Johannes Floss, and Lydia Abrego did simulations, we did experiments and, and it matches quite well. Now, what about this oscillation? What's this? This is this is a, a, these are actually block oscillations. I mean it's just the same, it's one-dimensional block lattice in angular momentum now. Uh, and so all all of this physics that you know about uh, that comes out of you know thinking about periodic systems applies to this temporally periodic system. It's just the time is the period is the periodicity that you worry about. Okay. That was kind of cool. Let's now get to more molecular physics and atomic physics that we care about. Uh, how many different ways can we think of to create this impulse condition? So for example, there's been a lot of talk, particularly by me in my first lecture, about strong field ionization, not only by me. It's, of course, it's, it's essential for harmonic generation and for the generation of atosecond pulses. So let's just think about that ionization itself. Is tunnel ionization another, it's another form of sudden ionization for sure. I mean, the model is ionization happens at some threshold condition for the electric field, which is oscillating periodically. So you get to that threshold and boom, everything happens. Sounds impulsive kind of, right? So it's certainly sudden, and in this, in this definition that I made of what an impulse is, that is the time scale of the interaction is, is shorter than one over the energy splitting of the energies involved, right? It's impulsive. And uh, in fact, here's a little cartoon that makes that even more highly motivated. 
And that is that here's a, this is diatomic molecule. Think of this as nitrogen, which one with the, often gets used. And let's say that it's now perpendicular to our, our uh, strong laser polarization. And so the tunneling will happen through some little saddle point here. Okay? And now let's project this location of the saddle point on the spectrum of states, and we'll see that it actually projects under more than one state. It's not just the highest occupied orbital that has some overlap with that position in space. The other, other orbitals do too. If I can think of ionization as just allowing stuff to leak out through that hole, then what leaks out should not just simply be the lowest or the highest occupied orbital, but some of the inner orbitals, which are more deeply bound, but are also located here, should also participate. Okay, so there's a prediction based on this idea of impulse. That, that participation should be coherent so long as that tunnel ionization was fast compared to the energy splitting. This is where the energy splitting compared to the time of the interaction comes up. Okay, is that clear? Yes? Did you say that again? <laughs> I have an energy splitting between natural energy splitting between different orbitals in my system. Okay? I have a highest orbital, I have a next highest orbital. There's electrons in these orbitals. It's a closed shell system, so it's actually got multiple electrons in these orbitals, right? Uh, I'm now going to suddenly, or at least sudden in the context of what we define as an impulse, suddenly tip the potential water starts to slosh out of the bathtub, you know, electrons start to slosh out of the potential, okay? Where did they come from? Which orbital will feel the loss of an electron? That's the question. And the answer I'm proposing is it's just an impulse limit kind of a thing. If the time scale on that, for that sudden tunneling is fast compared to the energy splitting between these levels, and if the other conditions like the position of the, of the tunnel is, is, is in the right place where those orbitals exist, then we should naturally pull out from more than the highest occupied orbital. Okay? Okay, well, high harmonics experiment. This is the first high harmonics data I've shown, but, you know, everybody can play that game. You can go back to your own labs or your laboratory friends and say, hey, you should do some high harmonic stuff. It's easy, it's fun. And so here's a high harmonic spectrum of nitrogen. Oh, of uh, aligned nitrogen. You know, always take the stuff early in your talk and use it for the stuff later in your talk, right? <laughs> and this is aligned nitrogen. You know how we align it now. And here is the highest occupied orbital in a nitrogen that is with, has its axis oriented this way. Here's the next orbital. And what I do is I change the angle of my strong field ionization with respect to the alignment, which now you know I, I know how to do. Okay? And I see how the spectrum changes. When you get out here to nitrogen, <coughs> you kind of get a new little piece of harmonic <coughs> spectrum coming out, okay? And what we were able to show in a number of papers was that this actually is caused, and it's now been heard by other people, so it's pretty much accepted. It went from, we don't believe it, to, oh yeah, that's boring, which is a wonderful thing for, for experimental research. You get to that limit, and you know you, you won. So, so this is in the, oh, that's boring stage now. Yeah, sure, when you're out here, you get this extra piece because there is harmonic generation caused by tunnel ionization from this orbital in addition to this orbital for exactly that reason that, that we discussed. So that's happening, okay? Um, oh, I, here I just, everything I just said, I'm just repeating on this slide, sorry about that. High harmonic spectra suggests coherent tunneling from multiple orbitals, leading to atosecond beats. And, and the experimental evidence is, yeah, you see, you can, yeah, yes, yeah, that happens. So, even take it further, I showed this slide before, didn't really explain very much about it. It's another high harmonic spectrum, now from a much more complicated molecule, sulfur dioxide. A, 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 a triatomic non-linear, it's a bent molecule, and you try to kick that and it tumbles, but in a coherent way. You know, it doesn't align, unfortunately, it's an asymmetric top. But, it does undergo coherent rotational wave packet evolution, which you can track 
and deduce from that evolution simply by looking at where these peaks and dips are in the harmonic spectrum as a function of time delay since when you kick in. You can deduce again which orbitals are participating in the SO2 harmonic generation and no surprise by this time, of course it's not the highest occupied molecular orbital. It's any orbital that's hanging out there. When it's 